to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hello, I'm Congressman Bill Pascrell, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of To the Point. Here in the United States, we tend to get caught up in the circus of federal politics. As a former New Jersey State Assemblyman and Mayor of Patterson, New Jersey, I can personally attest to the importance of local and state politics. In contrast with the hot-button issues of Washington, local and state politics have the potential to impact our lives on a daily basis. It is imperative that we follow the news of state and local governance and understand how it affects us. And I'm sure that my guest will agree. These turbulent times demand principled leadership and moral courage from our elected officials. Remember those words, please. In choosing a new governor last year, New Jersey saw a strong voice, uh, a voice to tell this White House that if it pushes policies that harm New Jerseyans, like us, we're gonna fight back. Governor Phil Murphy was born in Newton, Massachusetts, attended both Harvard University and the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2005, he was asked by Governor Richard Cody to share a committee intended to propose changes to New Jersey's pension system. Big issue on a state level and federal level. In the following year, he was appointed as the National Finance Chairman of the National Democratic Committee. Just three years later, he was named ambassador to Germany. We're very proud of him. He was President Obama named him to that position. And in November 2017, Phil Murphy became Governor Murphy, winning a decisive victory. Governor, I thank you for being here today. We're honored to have you. Welcome aboard. I'm so happy to be here, Congressman. Thrilled to be with you as always. Governor, uh, my first question deals with the tunnel. I was on a committee for 14 years that went to Newark usually once a month, Yep. planned with the regional authority, planning association, with Democrats and Republicans at the meetings. And I thought it was engineeringly solid, yep. politically solid, financially solid. It was a good project, but it was a necessary project. This, now, this is not make work. Right. And you saw what happened. The former administration shut it down after it started. We're talking about four or 5,000 jobs here. Yep. And we didn't get done. 14 years out the window, because that's how long it takes to plan. You bet. You saw what happened in the, in, the, in the budget recently. We passed the omnibus budget bill. In that bill is money. We, could, we got seed money to start this thing. And we're on solid grounds, regardless of the threats of the administration. How important is this tunnel to be built now? Yep. In fact, maybe it's good that it's being built during the Murphy administration, but why is this so important to the commerce and industry of our area and the entire country? Amen. Again, it's great to be with you, as always. We're honored. Um, I'm honored, uh, and thank you for having me. And you mentioned the cancellation of the prior tunnel, which was right. called the Arc Tunnel. Right. Uh, even uh, its critics thought, you know what, it may not be perfect, but it's a huge game changer. As you mentioned, years went into the planning. Uh, the amount of money that was rounded up at the federal level took years to get, as you know better than probably most. Uh, and the prior administration precipitously canceled that. And as you suggested, Congressman, it not just cost jobs in the here and now at that point, but the long-term implications. We haven't had a tunnel built under the Hudson River in over 100 years. So along comes the Gateway Project, which is the successor to the Arc Tunnel. Hats off to you and your colleagues for including, as you said, that, that seed money in this omnibus spending bill over the objection of the president himself. Yes, and uh, the secretary. And secretary of transportation. transportation. And by the way, um, Frankly, they should look in the mirror and ask themselves, what the heck are they thinking? They, know. they know how important this is, because your question was, how big a deal is this? This is a big deal. This is a big deal for New Jersey and New York, clearly, to allow folks the simple, at the simplest level to get in and out of New York safely and on time right. uh, to work, if that's where they work, uh, to increase that trans-Hudson uh, commerce that is so vital to both of our states. But it's beyond that. It's a Northeast Corridor imperative 
which is why you saw, and you saw this better than I did, both sides of the aisle in a whole bunch of states stood up and said, we want this, Absolutely. right? I think it's a national economic, if not a national security imperative. Um, so the, the facts are with us, which is the great thing. And at the end of the day, thank God, after a period of time, we're, at least in this state, we're digging out of a time when facts and science didn't matter. Uh, making decisions as you all did in Congress based on fact and science. I'm confident with this seed money, we'll get this gateway project going. And then ultimately, it'll take many years to finish, but it'll be worth it. We got to move people in product regardless. No question. You know, Eisenhower, who was a Republican president a few years ago, stood up courageously within his own party yep. and fought for the interstate highway you system. Bet. People laughed at him at the time. So yep. this, is, this is a local issue. Well, baloney, never get anything done. This is an interstate issue. You bet. He built it. He you started bet. to build the highway system, which we are, we're, you know, which, which we, we benefit with. from now. That's, that's correct. And by the way, his name is on it, all right? Yes, right? that's Deservedly. absolutely true. Yeah. This, this should not be a partisan issue. 100%. This is, this is something that's affecting all of us. But he built the highway system for the main reason, not only to help commerce, very critical. Yep. But this is a homeland security issue. No question. We gotta move people. And when you need to move people, you better have the highways. I mean, our roads are clogged every day, you know that. You bet. And they spill onto the local roads. You bet. And, and this is causing a major, major, major problem. I'll give you another one. Uh, it's got a big positive environmental impact. If we get this tunnel built, more people will feel confident about taking a train as opposed to a car. That's good news for the environment. Right. It's good news for our roads that'll free up. You know this better than I do. There's a lot of shenanigans, a lot of, a, lot of, a lot of craziness going on with this administration Absolutely. in Washington right now. So I give you all and your colleagues, including, by the way, both sides of the aisle. Rodney Freelinghouse on the other side of the aisle was a champ he here. A point on it. Uh, and, and you guys did a great job pushing back. Let's make decisions based on facts. Rod, and Rodney, uh, I went over to him and congratulated him after we passed the, the, the budget bill. And he says, you're congratulating me, Bill? And, and I said, yes, I am. He says, maybe I don't go back to the planning board and of this whole budget exactly. done. And I said, no, I'm very serious about yeah. it. And, you know, Rodney, Rodney did a great job while he was here. I didn't yep. agree with his politics all the time, but yeah. that's immaterial. Yep. You know, th this leads me to the second issue, which since we're talking about transportation and moving people, the transit system. Yep, our now, own. We, we badgered this administration, the former administration, on this issue. Yep. Safety. Yep. Something is wrong. Yep. And I, when I stood at that crash in Hoboken, I was just coming back from Washington. They took me right. I, the governor asked me to be in the I said, no, no, no. I didn't come here for a photo op. Yep. I'm going to look at the accident. Yep. And I looked at every one of those endpoints in the, where the trains come in. None of them could, were solid. They no. were rusted out. Yep. We leave these things to, to, to chance. Yep. A woman was killed in Amen. that Amen. when the train went right up on the platform. Where, where do you see the transit system? Is yeah. it is it savable? Yeah, it is definitely savable. The good there's good news here, but we're digging out. It's a mess. It's a mess. It's as good an example as any I can think of that describes the narrative of the past eight years of leadership in New Jersey. You know, gutting government, stripping it bare using tax gimmicks so you can say I didn't raise Sounds taxes. Good. Sounds right? good. Sounds good, right? <laughs> uh, ripping our progressive ideals to the right. NJ Transit's a poster child for that. So the last administration didn't have leadership in there that was experienced in transit. They cut the state support by 90% at one point, 9-0. They took money from capital budget to make up for the operating shortfall, which probably impaired, not probably, absolutely impaired our safety. Uh, and they, by the way, while they were doing all that, fares went up 36% in eight uh -huh. years. Figure that. So I used to say to people, by the way, is your commuting experience <laughs> up 36%? Yeah. So what have we done? One is we've, we've started an audit to figure out how, they, how the heck they spent that money. We put new leadership in place, a new executive director, a new chair. That, You're confident in those I'm folks, very too. confident. And thirdly, we put in a record amount of funding from the state. Right. And our budget has $241 million going into NJ Transit, which is a tripling of the support. Now, money can't buy you everything. Right. So that's why you need that leadership, as you know better than I. Uh, I think that combination will allow us to get back to that place. It wasn't that long ago. You and I have had this conversation offline. NJ Transit was a national role model. Absolutely. Right? As a commuter it's rail the system. Biggest, 
public transit system in the country. Yeah, it's one of the big ones, right? And if you neglect it, you're, yeah. not, you're hurting a lot of people. No question. And by the way, one other comment. We speak, and I'll, I'm guilty of this myself, disproportionately about rail. We also have to remember the bus system in mm -hmm. our state is hugely important, particularly in our cities. You know, Patterson is a great example of that. So we got to make sure both sides of that equation are punching at their weight. Right. It won't be overnight, it but I'm confident overnight. we'll get back to where we need to be. I think, I think it's so critical. People have to understand this and, and, and be aware of what the present federal administration is saying about how we're going to get money into infrastructure, yep. which we've neglected. Yep. Our roads, our bridges, our airports, our underground infrastructure, water, clean water, sewage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That doesn't fall out of the sky, does it, Governor? No, it does and not. And we got to figure out a way to pay for these things, unlike what's been happening in the past, yep. where we don't pay for them. And it's on the on the backs of our kids and our grandkids. Amen. But, but the thing that you need to understand is that this administration is recommending that we turn around how much money is going to come for the federal government and how much money the states are going to have to put up in these projects. It's like a 70-30 turnaround. 100%. This is impossible when those governors understand. I don't care whether you're blue state, red state, green state. Yep. In, those, in those states, when they figure out how it's going to increase taxes in their particular states, particularly property taxes, we should wipe this idea away and get rid of it. Yep. And unfortunately, it's there. It's there. So listen, I, I, when Trump was, when he got elected, which I still can't believe happened, but it did, um, he talked a good game on infrastructure. And for all the things I disagree with him about, I thought that was the one area so we could I. find common ground. You so and I, I, again, thought it, spoke about that. I was down there a month ago. I spoke to him personally. I spoke to his team. Their view of how you approach infrastructure is in a different place than different ours. Different world. So, uh, as you said, that they see a very modest role for the federal government, right. a big role for state, local, and private capital. Turn everything back to the states. A amen. Not just transportation. <clears throat> everything. Education. Turn it more back to the states. And, more and, burden. And, and listen, I'm, on the one hand, I, I'm going to say, particularly in this administration, states will have never mattered more. Governors will have never mattered more. I get that. But there's no replacing the federal government in infrastructure, right. in health care, in public education. Uh, so philosophically, we've got to hope that these folks come to their senses. But the longer it goes, the less confident I have to say I am. You saw the battle we had at the end of last year uh, over the tax cuts. Yes. Again, another bumper sticker reaction to a very serious problem. We hadn't had tax reform since 1985 when our own senator, Senator Bill Bradley, led the way yep. on this. And we got something that was not just tax cuts. It was reform to the system. Now, they promised us we'd be able to make our taxes out on a postcard. This is the worst situation we've had. I've talked to the guy that helps me do my taxes. Yep. I said, you know, you're nowhere near a postcard. And next year will be worse than the year after. You'll need a shoebox of postcards. Yes. Right. Uh, we fought over the state and local taxes. That tax mm -hmm. deduction goes back before the code to the Civil War. Yep. Yep. And the reason why it came into view and became a reality was during the war we had to raise money yep. for the effort yep. to defend the United States of America at that time. So what we're talking about here is trying to protect local governments and the states yep. so that they have enough resources so the federal government does not prey upon them. Yep. And, and, and this is 1865. I know. We're not talking about 1915 here. We're talking about 1865. We fought. We lost the issue. We got a little bite. People, $10,000 of their property taxes they can deduct, but the, the average property tax in New Jersey is between eighteen and $19,000. So there you yeah. are. It was a real jolt to New Jersey. No question. New York, Connecticut, a lot of states around here. Yep. About particularly nine, ten states. Yep. But other people use that deduction in other states that are not as greatly affected. You bet. What are we doing about that? And where do you see us going? And you know darn well if a miracle happens next November, this coming November, 
that's we're going to try to turn that around. You bet. People are hurting. No question. Of this. So that's first point. I'm, there are a bunch of points to make, and I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time. First point is elections have consequences. Having big success this November <clears throat> in the House and the Senate uh, allows us then the opportunity to turn back some of this stuff. Secondly, we're joining other states in challenging the legality of this. We're going to court on this? We're going to court, 100%. Okay. With New York, Connecticut, California. As you mentioned, it's about a dozen states. I yes. think they're all blue. Right. That's not a coincidence, as you and I know, right? Uh, so we're, going, uh, we're, we're, we're challenging the, the legality of double taxation, the constitutionality of it. Right. Um, thirdly, um, we believe the IRS has put out there in precedent in 33 other states the opportunity to claim a charitable deduction. Uh, yeah, I want for, you to explain yeah, that, please. So uh, in 33 other states, the IRS has blessed charitable deductions. In many, not, not all, many if not most cases, it's because somebody had a problem with public education right. and they wanted to send their kid to private school right. and get the same deduction for the tuition that they otherwise would have I gotten got from that portion of their property taxes that would go to public education. IRS has blessed that in 33 other states. Right. Good news, Congressman, a lot of them are red states. So we're saying, you know what? With all due respect, towns should be able to set up a parallel payment structure. Instead of paying your property taxes into bucket A, right. pay it into bucket B, right. a new, new co, as they say, and right. get a charitable deduction for that. People say, well, wait a minute, the IRS may not go for that. I say, yeah, but we believe, and this is our theory, right. that if they undo our precedent, they're going to have to revisit and or undo the precedent in the other So we don't have states. a definitive answer we on do that not. yet. But will the definitive answer come the, from the courts or the IRS? My guess is first from the IRS, right. and then we'll battle it, I would guess, not a lawyer, but I would believe we'd battle it and ultimately the courts. Right. Now, there's one last thing we've done with our own budget in New Jersey. With the, I, I put forth our bu budget ad address two weeks right. ago. We've raised the cap in New Jersey from $10,000 to $15,000. Yeah, how is that going to work? Well, that, that'll impact a, a lot of uh, property taxpayers. I think 500 and something thousand wow. in property taxpayers in New Jersey will be, will be drawn into that, uh, that, right. that, under that limit from 10,000 to 15,000. Now, is this, this is the state tax. Correct. Itself. Now, if that's the case, let me ask you, let me ask you this tough question now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're a tough governor, so well, let me ask you a tough question. How is that going to, what is that going to do to the revenue for the state? I'm concerned about that. We, we, we scored it out. Right. It's actually not a crazy amount of money. I think it's something in the magnitude of $90 million a year. That's on a $37 billion budget. That's not it much. grows over time, compared, compared but it doesn't, grow, it doesn't grow right. a crazy number. Uh, if we could do more, listen, we've inherited a state which is fiscally right. a train wreck. If we could do more and keep raising that cap, if we get ourselves stabilized financially, we'll, we'll consider how, doing that. How did you get to the, how do you understand the magnitude of what you inherited? At what point? Was it before the, uh, uh, was it before the election? Was it before you got sworn in? Was it after you got sworn in? Was it I a was, month after you got sworn in? You said, oh my God, and I showed you the books, books? Exactly, oh my Lord. I'd say, I'm proud of the fact that our team had a pretty good handle from the outside during our campaign right. of what to expect. But you, you never know until you're on the inside. And I would say, for the most part, fiscally, the surprises have been overwhelmingly negative. We haven't really, we haven't uncovered a pot of gold hiding somewhere <laughs> uh, and don't expect to. Your, your election, I think, was critical for a lot of reasons. We try to keep this program nonpartisan as much as possible. Yep. But... You're inheriting a situation, unlike the former governor, uh, you're inheriting a situation where both houses are Democratic. Yep. That helps a little bit. If everybody's on the same page. So that's one situation. The other situation is lasting effects on the people of our state are always done best with bipartisan. No question. Now, how do you... How do you tie the two things in together, the first part and the yeah. second part. I think you can, and by the way, uh, it's, a, it's a big focus for me personally, it, it always has been. So on the one hand, I'm a proud Democrat. I got my Democratic principles, I grew up, my dad didn't get out of high school, my mom did, we grew up uh, outside of Boston as Kennedy Democrats. Uh, that's those are the most important right. moments of my life in terms of how I'm, I've been defined. I'll never give that up. The money did not fall out of the sky. It did not, okay. by, by a long shot. 
Uh, but by the same token, we get there long, we stay longer, we get there faster, and it's stronger if we do it together. Right. And so right out of the box, blocks in transition, I sat with the Assembly Minority Leader Bramnick, the Senate uh, Minority Leader Tom Kane Jr., expressed my keen interest in working, finding common ground. Um, I make it a regular part of my daily outreach to reach out to folks on the other side of the aisle, whether they be in legislation, right. mayors, so it's not do a lot of and, mayors. It's not one and done. I don't think it can be, and you know yeah. that You know that so well. Um, you know, we talked about Gateway. I spent a lot of time talking about him publicly, speaking with him privately, and encouraging and supporting Rodney Freelinghausen's right. efforts as right. the Republican chair of the Appropriations Committee in Congress, a guy y y you and I already spoke about earlier. So I believe there is, the philosophy is we should try to get there together if we can. We should never do that if we have to give up our principles right. and our core beliefs. But I think you can do both. I think you can have it both ways. I think you can keep your principles and still find common ground, and that's what we're committed to. What do you, what do you, you know, you got to the job, obviously, and you've served a certain amount. We don't know when this will be shown on the air, uh, but it's, the, the, it's still timely. Uh, what's the big surprise? You have a big surprise since you got sworn in? I'd say the big surprise as a budget is that these the uh, we as the budget that we presented right. was that there were very few surprises. <laughs> so we did we telegraphed yeah. how we campaign, your campaign how there's, we transition connection between your campaign and what the budget reflects. Yeah, which is unusual. Yeah, I mean I, I I'm proud it's of easy that. to make promises 100%. in a campaign. Well, we're we, good at it in the Congress. You no, know no, that. I, listen, <laughs> we won the primary. Uh, handily, and then right. in the general election, somebody said, hey, why didn't you tack to the center? I said, because what I said in the primary is what I believe. Right. And then they asked again, well, you're not going to put a budget together that actually right. talks about uh, uh, it, it, the more money into ed uh, or pre-K or community college or higher ed or infrastructure, NJ Trans. I said, actually, we are going to do that. <laughs> Secondly, I would say there's a great responsibility with the job, and I anticipated that. It's very humbling to be the, the governor of this state. Uh, and, 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 you know, I've seen it in things big and small in the first seven right. or eight weeks. Uh, we've had a bunch of storms. I've had to declare a couple of states of emergency. You know, two, two of our citizens uh, were killed by touching down pyre, power right. lines. That's right. One literally and one uh, whose car was incinerated. Making the decision is, do you, do, you, do, you, do you declare a state of emergency? Do you declare a truck ban? I just spoke to a, a, a trooper this morning who saved someone's life uh, off the parkway uh, uh, last weekend. Uh, so it's, I say all that because while I anticipated it, it, there's nothing like being in the seat, your hand on the Bible, and saying, okay, now you're there. And that responsibility is, is great, and I'm humbled by it. You're, you're a very progressive thinking person, uh, and yet you've taken up the mantle of the police of this state state police as well as local police sheriff's departments and you have built i've seen i've seen and as chairman of law uh, law and order yep. as they say but as the the uh, uh, responders are responders in the in the house and the senate um you understand what these guys and gals go through every day yep how did you see that relationship, and how important is it to you being the governor of the state of New Jersey? Listen, it's hugely important. I have a, uh, color me uh, uh, for what it is. I've got a soft spot, uh, an emotional connection with first responders, with veterans. Those are the groups that I would say, uh, that I say, you know what, they either are or they have put their right. lives on the line every day. I now uh, have the great honor of being with members of the state police 24 hours a day, right? Uh, and they're extraordinary. Yes. Uh, but as you also mentioned, it extends beyond that to state and local. I mean, I grew up, again, not with much, but with a lot of respect for teachers, coaches, mm -hmm. police, fire, veterans are, are gr groups that my mom and dad, when we were growing up, you know, th they were always held out as special folks for us. Uh, my, my folks were in the greatest generation, so they had a lot of their friends and, and siblings who went to war and fought for their country. We're, it's something that comes naturally. We're spending a lot of time lately in the federal, on the federal level to deal with pensions. Yep. To look at the pensions of the public worker and to look at the pensions of the private worker. And those pension plans have been shrinking. Yep. 
we've got this challenge in New Jersey probably more so than any state in the nation. I think our pension system is rated the weakest in the country. Yes. And that's largely due to 20 years of basically the state neglecting or not standing up for not its putting side it of its the money. obligation. Not putting its money. I mean, those, those bargaining units put yep. the money in. 100%. Yeah. I don't like imposing on people yep. what the new pension system is going to look like. Yep. I think that's got to come to a conclusion. Yeah. Listen, I'm a big believer in collective bargaining. And, and that's the, that's, I always say it's the intel chip inside of the whole notion of organized labor. But I think, and I feel strongly, that unless the state ultimately meets its full obligation, it hasn't got the right to sit down and say, okay. Yeah. Because people say right now, well, why don't you just get them to d do some other, I said, let me ask you a question. If you were left at the altar for 20 years in a row, and on year 21 you heard, hey, by the way, if you make the following concessions next year, I'll be good for it you'd say, you know what, take a hike. So I think we've got to restore our trust and credibility right. as a state. And then, and then I think you sit down and say, listen, yeah. now we're finally made whole. How do we take it from here? Right. And I've found the, the interactions to be very reasonable uh, uh, for folks who have been left at the altar for 20 years. We have a lot of things we can talk about. I wanted to get into health issues about how, how you're responding. I mean, the, the, the last administration at least got it half right. They extended... Uh, Medicaid. Yep. And, and and that was very important. No question. Very important for them. Many states did not. Yep. They're, in, they're in peril right now yep. uh, over this. Plus, the administration in Washington has cut back on subsidies. Now, how are we going to stop premiums from going you through bet. the roof? Yep. That's a big, big issue. Yep. Very big issue. And as you know, this the Trump administration has cut the sign up period in half, they've cut the budget to advertise the sign up period. We've said, you know what, on that one, we're going to compensate for that and we're going to make sure everybody and their uncle knows about when that period is coming up and that they're, we're advertising in all branches of government. But, but what I don't see from your office is yelling into the air and throwing your arms in the air. No, we're not I want to commend you for standing up. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, yeah. You just got here. I don't hear from anybody that I distrust this guy. Yep. I don't see anything like that which is a healthy thing to be. Amen. Even for the people that didn't vote for you. Amen. So you got a beautiful family. Thank you, Congressman. That's the most important thing in your life. Knock on wood. And knock on wood. We wish them well. Thank you this so much. This is going to be an experience for you. I hope you're here for eight years. God willing. And and people in New Jersey trust that you're going to do the best you can. Thank you. Man, that's a great spot to be in. Thank you for that. And I, Governor, I, thank you. Always a pleasure, my man. And it always moved, a pleasure. It moved quickly. God bless you. Loved every minute of it. And have a great, great, great term. You betcha. Thank you. Thank you. We're here for you all the time. Thank you for watching, and we'll be seeing you soon on To The Point.